Thank you very much. I, c I can be heard, can I? Good. Um, I see I'm billed as a Scottish historian, um, which uh, allows me to introduce the subject of good nationalism and bad nationalism. Um, uh, I don't know what Scottish nationalism is about. Uh, you know, nationalisms are usually about something. But Scottish nationalism is just an embarrassment and a bore, um, and I'm sorry. Uh, when I'm speaking a foreign language, I say Ongol um, uh, but otherwise known as British, and I hope this nightmare goes away. I don't know what it is about modern Europe that it creates these funny minority nationalisms. I mean, Flemish nationalism abolished the great University of Louvain. What for? The Catalans and so on, down with it. But there is good nationalism, which uh, is obviously the case with 1956. Um, we mustn't forget that poor old Hungary has had, a, in the 20th century, a really dreadful time. Now, uh, as it happens, I've been asked to write a short history of Hungary since 1848. and. Um, uh, my Hungarian is enough to read the, frankly, very, very good historians you've got. They're much better than the Austrians, who are boring. Um, <laughs> much better. And uh, it, if you think back to 1867, what it's like when Hungary comes back on the map, um, Budapest then built up with uh, huge energy. Uh, learning intelligently from abroad. I mean, they looked at the English underground and they said, this is the best underground system of the 1860s and it has remained the best underground system of the 1860s. And they got Bazalgette to come in and tell them about sewage, all this sort of thing. Budapest must have been a building site for most of those 30 years and what an achievement. And I'm afraid it ends in tears. Maybe Koshut was right in saying, don't hitch yourself to the Germans, because they'll go mad in the end. And that was the tragedy of Hungary in both world wars. And then you got communism on top of it. And now perhaps we're getting back to another version of 1867, when Hungary at last has hope again. I was... <laughs> I mean, this is a slightly tasteless thing to say, but I was uh, reading Romšić's very good history of modern Hungary, and I noticed that suicide statistics are taken as, an, as a measure of national morale. Um, I hope they'll go down, because hun Hungary's obviously going somewhere. Now, I mustn't go on too long, but I'd better explain something about... Uh, how I came to be interested in Hungary. Um, I'm Scottish all the way back. Um, by the way, uh, there was a rather embarrassing episode in Transylvania when the Calvinist Sekels gathered and, and demonstrated in favor of Scottish nationalism. I think they thought that because the Scots are Calvinists, they were vaguely oppressed so they felt solidarity. No. Scottish nationalism is a product of mainly female, mainly ex-Catholics, I think, to be proved, but I suspect it enough. Now, uh, I got interested in Austria-Hungary and uh, went when I was a student to the British Council and said, have you a scholarship for Austria? And they said, no something has just come in the post from Hungary. And this was 1962. And it was a language course in Debrecen, uh, which I did again in 1963. Uh, you arrived in Hedjesholm, that eight-hour journey, the customs inspect everything. Uh, and then, all of a sudden, 
you find yourself in the Grand Hotel in the mortgage they get. Um, and it went up and down the Astoria one minute and then some agricultural college in the province of Nyiradjaza the next. It was absolutely fascinating. Now, I'm older, I think, than considerably older than almost everybody in this room. So you probably do not remember or even know what Budapest was like in 1962. Dark, grim, there would be one shop every thousand, kilo th thousand meters marked Zoltschig. Um, it, uh, it, was, it was grim. The, the signs of the siege were there. All the bullets of 1956, the Matyash a near ruin, the castle a ruin, the Elizabeth Bridge was put up in my last year here, uh, and the. But there was something about it. There was something about it which had some kind of life, and you know, uh, I came back um, in the 80s, and uh, you know, um, Professor Fodor was being gloomy about the Kadar years, but. I would slightly defend it because, you know, if, if you came with a foreign passport, you met a, an outstandingly good intelligentsia, people who'd read everything, spoke languages, knew the national culture, and I think precisely because public life was so boring, you, co you concentrated on the things that mattered, family life, learning things, playing a musical instrument at which Hungary was superb. Now, I would in a sense defend the Kadar system because um, at least you could travel, you could read, and you got the possibility of launching this extremely interesting country back on the map, whatever the temporary problems. Now, where does 1956 fit in? I think I would class it simply as good nationalism. Uh, this country had been dreadfully humiliated all the way through by the Germans and then by, in the Rakashi period, uh, the Soviet embassy dominated everything and uh, there is a sudden eruption of rebellion. I'm sh I wonder if it's not true that Khrushchev encouraged or Andropov encouraged the early phase of that in order to get rid of Rakoshi. I remember I met a, an old man in a tram in Debrecen, and he spoke English in a sort of Edwardian way because he had had English nannies, and he was the son of the last governor general of Pola in the Austro-Hungarian Navy. His name was Guillaume, and he said, that revolution in 1956, the, everybody knows that when writers start protesting, they're pushed into it. And he suspected some kind of Soviet plot. I don't know whether this is in any way demonstrable, but it's a suggestion. But still, it turned into good nationalism, and it did give the Soviet system a shock. And I think it was, it's, it's, that is part of the reason that by 1962, the Soviets were saying to countries, Hungary above all, make some kind of bridge to the West. Invite your diaspora people from Transylvania, from the Subcarpathian Ukraine, get some, student, some students from the West, and see if you can start making bridges and turning Hungary into a sort of Soviet version of Austria. I wonder if that's not a long, uh, not an effect of 1956. Um, and as far as Hungary was concerned, it did lead on to the progressive reforms of the Kadar years, the new economic mechanism, all this kind of thing, which meant that whatever happened, you were not going to be Romania. And Romania was dismal. I went there in the late 80s, uh, in the early 80s, and it's, uh, Hungary escaped that fate.
So I think in the end, if there's hope, uh, it's something to do with 1956, not something to be forgotten at all, and good luck for the future. Thank you.